Hello everyone, Mikey Dare Panginate here with Dev Diary number 20. And today we are talking about naval treaties and ship refits, two game mechanics that will go hand in hand. Of course, all the usual disclaimers about art and numbers not being final, but let's jump right in. So historically, uh, after World War I, Britain and France's economies were devastated and the US and Japan were just chilling, not very devastated, lots of money, all that sort of thing. And so the British and the French were worried that they were going to there was going to be another naval arms race like the ones like the one that led up to World War One. And so uh, you know, with newer guns, newer tech, and all that, and they were worried they weren't going to be able to keep up. So there was the Washington Naval Treaty of 1922, which forbade any new battleships for constructions for ten years, and uh, limited the maximum size of guns and the ships themselves. And uh, in 1930, all the signatories of the Washington Naval Treaty came together and negotiated the London Naval Treaty, which limited construction of cruisers and um, put strict restrictions on their size. And uh, in 1936, the London Naval Treaty was up for renegotiation, and uh, that's where the trouble started, and that's where we start with the game. So, basically, uh, the results of the Washington and London Naval Trees resulted in some very interesting designs. Um, not can't really be modeled in well of the as well in the game, but like the Nelson class of battleships, which had all the turrets for the superstructure, or uh, I know like the Pensacola class for the Americans and all of those things. So uh, you can see here, you can uh, when you start the game, you have uh, if you're a signatory of the of the if you are playing a nation that was a signatory of the London Naval Treaty you will have a national spirit which will limit the cost of cruisers heavy ships and carriers um, moving on and uh, so let's see um, so they were thinking about doing tonnage I know they mentioned this in a previous dev diary and also restricting modules uh, because you know the treaty did limit gun calibers and all that but in the end uh, the devs decided you know what? let's just go with a um, cost limiter, limiter because instead of adding the whole tonnage system and having to worry about that and all those things it's um, pretty much uh, just you know uh, stay within the limits of the construction cost so you know they don't want you to research a new gun and be like hey you can't use that new gun yet but if you want to use the new gun you might have to sacrifice armor or other modules so uh <laughs> in the, this screenshot <laughs> I, I, I need to stop laughing uh, they, they, they named this battleship or this heavy ship treaty mcbreakface and uh, as you can see it is over the production cost so you will not be able to build it and uh so whenever you start the game in 1936 you'll notice the mission taking down about the second london naval treaty um if you don't decide to bail or if you, you know you choose to stay involved then you'll become a signatory and be enrolled in the second treaty if you bail uh well bailing is only available during well, it's first available here, and uh, it costs political power, and it's much cheaper if you are a fascist nation. However, being a fascist, you uh, might be better off staying in the treaty and deciding to cheat around with everything, um, which will reduce the restrictions on you while, you know, you lie through your teeth to the enforcers of the treaty. Uh, a, a, Side note, they bring up the Dev Diary. The head of ship designer for the Royal Navy during the 1930s once remarked that the other side was either building their ships from cardboard or lying. And, uh, well, there's a joke about this later on in the rejected titles, so stay tuned. But you see the screenshot, Cheat on Naval Treaties. It gives you some more, uh, you know, heightens your production cap for all of the ships. And, uh, Continuing on, once world tension hits a certain level, the decision to leave the treaty are available for everyone. But if anyone leaves the treaty, either during the conference or afterwards, um, a, a timer starts ticking down, and the remaining countries 
can that'll activate there's uh, the historical escalator clause, which eases the restriction slightly, allowing even the signatories to build more powerful ships. So, if you're a fascist country, there's an incentive to stay, you know, signed on with the treaty, because it's better to stay signed on and cheat than it is to abandon it and have the escalator clause invoked. And, uh, of course, the, you know, the escalator clause, you can see in a year you'll be able to build ships with all of those costs going up. And uh, if you are a country that starts off not enrolled in the treaty, once you reach a certain percentage of the British in terms of capital, in the number of capital ships, you can be invited into the treaty. And if you decline and start expanding your navy, the treaty nations can uh, try and force you to disarm up to 80%. And if you refuse to disarm, you might go to war. So uh, signatory nation... So if a signatory nation exceeds the allocated amount of capital ships, then they will get a mission to reduce the number of capital ships or lose stability. So you're going to want to make sure you have the most capable capital ships, you know, quantity over, or wait, I got that backwards, quality over quantity, and you're, you know, you're limited number, but you're also limited in size, so you're going to want to make sure they're the best designs possible. And, uh, you know, they mentioned one of the most frustrating things about the old system was you'd research a capital ship and you start building it and it's typically obsolete by the time it is actually finished. And there's no way for it to be modernized. And, uh, of course, whenever um, with a ship designer, you know, the differences between ship types is going to be more gradual. So, therefore, we get the refit feature which allows us to upgrade our ships and tailor them to better suit our needs as situations change you know anything from upgrading anti-aircraft and battleships to removing torpedoes on the to add for depth charges or like the fletcher for those of you who are familiar with world of warships or you know history the uss kid was a fletcher that removed torpedo tubes for more aa so you'll be able to do that so you look at the screenshot you see the fleet or whatever and it looks like there's that little upgrade button and you can uh, have any variant based, or it looks like, you know, several different variants based on early heavy ship hulls, anywhere from, uh, to, you know, the Admiral class to Nelson class to a converted battleship carrier. So uh, all modules have a production cost and, uh, they also have a conversion cost as well as a dismantling cost. So the conversion cost determines how much it costs to convert that module from another module. And it's usually cheaper to upgrade anti-aircraft from level one to level two than it is to rip out a rear turret and put some anti-aircraft in its place. Of course, there are exceptions, uh, mostly for historical reasons. Um, so like upgrading engines, is a major effort that uh, would require you know a long time where you basically have to cut open the ship and get the old engines out and put the new engines in and patch it all up so it's usually not worth it but you can upgrade uh, so uh, one example is upgrading engines on an old battleship gets you two knots of speed at the cost of a modern light cruiser but there's always that option so uh, all in all it's bare it's going to be cheaper to build the right ship from the get-go so you're not gonna it's not gonna be a viable strategy to build a lower tier ship and re refit it to something more modern you, you're gonna want to build the best ship at the time and refit it as times go along a quick side note about the whole changing the engines and upgrading and only getting two knots of speed uh if you know anything about uh, fluid mechanics, hydrodynamics, ship design, there's this concept called the, the Froud number, the Froud number, where basically the ship hull is what limits uh, maximum speed. So an example you can see of this in military history is the USS South Dakota class, or the South Dakota class, South Dakota class American battleships were, you know, had pretty much the same main armament, same main armament and everything as the Iowa class, but the Iowa class was 10,000 tons heavier. Why? To get a longer, thinner, more, you know, a larger hole to get a better hole shape to get like three knots of speed. So you can, basically, you can upgrade the engines all you want, but the whole, the whole size and whole shape, 
is going to limit you. But uh, moving on, if there's no significant conversion costs scripted in, you have to pay this mailing cost for the old module and the construction costs of the new module. And modders will be pleased to hear that you can script in dismantling resource costs so you can actually gain resources back from scrapping certain components. And uh, we see a screenshot with the C-Class 1936 upgrade. Um, it looks like... So it looks like what you're going to do whenever you open, you decide, I want to refit a ship. You're going to have the option of all the different variants based on that hull, if I'm not mistaken. So, moving on. To refit a ship, you create a variant and then select the ship you want to refit, then order it to refit to the, that variant. The ship will detach and go to the nearest naval base and become an item in the production queue with a few special mechanics. Because it technically is st it's technically still a map, it can be bombed and damaged, which reduces build progress. If the provinces it is in is overrun by the enemy, it will be captured and may end up serving your enemies. That is amazing capturing ships in port sounds like a wonderful mechanic i wonder if this will also apply to fleets at large uh, maybe fleets at large will be kicked out the port like they are in eu4 currently in hearts of iron 4 if i'm not mistaken uh, usually the ai gets their navies killed before i have a chance to get my ground forces anywhere near them but you know considering a ship it, a ship that's being refit isn't just going to be able to sail away, you know, you assume it's in dry dock or whatever. So you can see, um, you know, a closer up C-Class 1936 upgrade or the carrier conversion. And uh, typically, you're not going to be able to refit between a hull, so a 1936 destroyer can only be refit to other 1936 destroyer variants, but you have a lot of freedom within that. So as long as you're using the same basic hull type, you can pretty much do whatever you want in that. Um, so a historical example is the Japanese Mogami class becoming, well, being built as a light cruiser and being refit to a heavy cruiser. The uh, exception of this would be aircraft carriers, where cruiser and battleship hulls can be converted into certain carrier hulls, which are not, they're usually not as capable as purpose-built carriers, but if you have old ships lying around, go for it. Um, and uh, so, you know, you can see the HMS series, which is a C-class carrier conversion. Very cool. And uh, of course, uh, some of, you know, another feature uh, some of us may have noticed in previous dev diaries is uh, this little crown icon. The Admiral Scheer is at game start, the pride of the fleet for Germany. And the pride of the fleet gives... Uh, gives Germany a small 5% war support bonus and the ship itself some bonuses to defense against critical hits. This is not historic in the case of the hood or the Arizona, may I add. Um, the Dev Diary only mentions the hood and uh, gives the pride of the fleet bonuses to experience gain. And, uh, you know, uh, if you have an admiral with a media personality trait, you'll get bonuses when that admiral is commanding a fleet with a pride of the fleet in it. So yeah, here we see the Admiral Shear, the Deutschland class, uh, with the little crown icon, Pride of the Fleet, and the little gold icon on it. So uh, whenever you assign a ship Pride of the Fleet, well, assigning it to that ship is free if you don't have one already, but changing your Pride of the Fleet costs political power and makes the crew of the old one very sad, you monster, in the words of Archangel, who is the writer of this wonderful dev diary. So you can only make capital ships Pride of the Fleet, and you should choose wisely because if you lose it, it gives you a penalty to war support for a while. You, we can see currently the numbers they're playing around with now is if you if it gets sunk you have minus 10 percent war support for a month and uh and you know the dev diary ends up with a call to watch the uh the stream this time the devs are going to show off some mexican gameplay so let's go over the rejected titles really quick and then i will finish up with a few words of my own rejected titles with a large enough pocket every battleship is a pocket battleship next up the italians actually were building their cruisers out of cardboard as it turned out as uh, someone later in the comments posted out pointed points out this is a missed opportunity for a pasta joke uh third on the list what really I what really is a heavy cruiser anyway next up get your discount cruisers 
and then you can now play with your Lego ships even after you have built them. Second last, I think armor is overrated anyway. Eh, not so sure about that, Chief. And finally, the C-Class carrier conversion has nothing on the T-Type torpedo transformation or the M-Model machine gun makeover. So, these two, the two main features here, the uh, treaties and the refits, go hand in hand. I, I like the idea of not just being able to build super ships right off the bat. Um, I like the idea, you know, the concept of having to play around a little bit. And uh, also, you know, refitting ships is going to be something nice. I'm going to, you know, as a country like America, instead of just spamming out ships and winning based on numbers, you're going to be incentivized, well, restricted by the treaty to, uh, you know, take the ships you have and constantly refit them, adding anti-aircraft, better guns and all that. And then once the, once the treaty is over, I mean, all, all bets are off. Although, I don't know if the escalator clause, if... Um, if those limits last the rest of the game or if the limits go away at some point anyway of course there is going to be kind of a soft limit in that uh, a ship that big will take forever to make because keep in mind they're uh, restricting the number of dockyards you can assign to each capital ship to five for big ones I think ten for some others and you know you're not gonna be able to dedicate 15 dockyards to a battleship like you used to beforehand so uh, I mean the screenshots don't seem as clear but the more I look at it the more it makes sense you basically just design a bunch of different ships off of each one and like the variants for airplanes and tanks I'm sure you can uh, mark some as older or decommission them so whenever you bring a ship to port you won't convert to the wrong thing so uh yeah I'm looking forward to this uh, you know again more depth to the production side of the game because when it comes down to it hearts of iron is mostly is mainly about combat and secondarily about military industry so you deciding on what to do with your industry in terms of building new ships or refitting your old ships i'm like refitting my old ships personally just you know the idea of making everything great uh <laughs> make navies great again uh, lol or and uh, also the, the carrier conversions are something that caught my eye because historically a lot of carriers were converted. I mean, um, a lot of Americans were based off of cruiser hulls or uh, even the Lexington was meant to be a battle cruiser. One of our carriers we started off the war with. And then you go to the Japanese, I think it's the Shinano was based off a of Yamoto hull. So I'm wondering if you're going to be able to take a ship midway through production and change what it is. Nothing about that in the dev diary, but that would be something I'd be interested in seeing because a lot of the examples of just of crew of uh, carriers based on other ships or you know they had a bunch of ships in production like we need carriers like oh well we have a few extra cruiser hulls here and you know we're not actually going to build battleships with these so you might as well go with uh carriers so i'm not sure not i didn't see anything in the dev diary i'm hoping that'll be a feature because i'd hate to have to wait for a ship to finish and then immediately refit it but who knows? We shall see in the future. Um, I'm looking forward to playing with this, of course. Let me know what you think. Uh, I, of course, am getting more and more anxious wanting to see Man the Guns. But uh, I, I love the idea of the naval treaties. And it adds something more to the political game and the strategy game other than, you know, just brute force. Just like, eh, let's just try and outproduce the enemy or just sit back in fortified areas and let them waste their manpower no you're actually gonna have you know some decisions to weigh ask the fascists like do i want to you know ch cheat a little bit or do i want to say to hell with the treaty and well you know have to compete basically at that point you're competing head-to-head -head entry versus industry so <clears throat> that's all i have let me know what you think i hope you enjoyed this uh run through of the dev diary if you did be sure to uh, leave a like, consider subscribing to the channel, follow me on Twitter, and check out my Patreon page. Thank you all so much for watching, and until the next one, this is Mikey Derpanginator, signing out. See ya, nerds!